Okay, I see some investors in the audience there. Nice to see everybody today. So, today I'm going to talk a bit about who we are and how we got here and where we came from and where we're planning to go in the next 12 to 18 months or so. There's a general disclaimer. So, about a year ago before, well, sorry, not a year ago, but about a year before we started Aurora, um, I stuck a post up on Facebook, which is, I guess, an unusual way for a company to begin. And um, I said, look, I'm planning to start a rocket company who's crazy enough to join me. And about five minutes later, a friend of mine sent back and said, yep, I'm in. That was Jess. She's one of our co-founders. And about a week later, she brought along a friend of hers, a guy called Will Crisp. And we started working together on making a liquid-cooled rocket motor, which is a little bit like a space shuttle main engine, but a little bit smaller and a little bit less complex. So about a year into this, and we're 90% of the way through building our first rocket motor, and um, I come up with this idea for making a low-cost 3D metal printer. And so I asked Will and Jess, because they had complementary skill sets to mine, whether they'd be interested in getting involved in the startup, and they said yes. And two and a half years later, here we are. So, so what is 3D printing? What's this additive manufacturing process? Essentially what it is, is taking a three-dimensional digital part and converting it into a solid 3D metal object by using a 3D printer. And the way this works is you start off first of all with the digital part. Now that can be something which is scanned where you ta take a physical part, you get a scanner, you wave it around in front of it for about five minutes and you end up with a 3D digital part. Alternatively, you can have an engineer use a piece of software like Inventor or SolidWorks and actually design a piece of equipment for you. So the digital part gets run through some software which slices it into a series of thin layers. So each of these slices is quite thin, they're about the thickness of a human hair or a bit less. And then um, uh, the first of these slices is actually fed digitally into the machine. We um, once the slice is fed in, a layer of powder is laid down in the 3D printer. Then um, a laser comes along and scans the surface in the exact shape of the 3D slice. Then another layer of powder is laid down, another slice is fed into the machine, and the laser comes along and scans the next slice, melting the material, fusing it to the layer below. This is then repeated in an iterative process again and again and again. And what you end, of it, end up with at the end of it is a 3D part that's an exact representation of your digital part, except it's been printed out of metal. So, where we go, when we looked at this, it was about at the beginning of the company, we looked at the 3D metal printing market. And we realized there were two fundamental main flaws with 3D printing today, as in 3D metal printing. One, Guess I better use one of these. <laughs> um, one was that, first of all, the machines were enormously expensive. And then secondly, they're incredibly slow. And uh, when you take a very expensive and incredibly slow machine, what you end up with is very, very expensive parts, typically in the order of two to $3,000 a kilo for parts. So there are really two solutions to this equation. That was basically, one was to make a very, very cheap machine or low-cost machine. The other one is to make a very, very fast one. And we've done both. So the company really has three core areas of technology. These are printers, both a low-cost machine and a very fast machine, powders. And we're looking at uh, powders as an, as an arm of the business because we see that that's going to be extensively used. And finally, downloadable digital parts. And we're looking at something there similar to an Apple iTunes store where you can download a part and have it verified in real time as it's being printed. So to go into a bit more detail about these technologies, with a small format printer, this is our first technology. So these are two quite dis distinct. It's quite important to understand. With the printing, we've got the small format printer, which is relatively slow, but relatively cheap or low cost. And the large format printer, it's not necessarily low cost, but it's extremely fast, looking to be able to print up to a ton a day or more in a day. So where we're at with the small format printer, we've now moved into full production. We're actually selling the machines and distributing them all over the world. 
We've pre-sold around about 32 machines and we're looking to get up to around about 30 machines a month within the next three to six months at around about 50,000 US dollars per machine. So these machines have been purchased from all over the world. They've, um, for a very broad range of applications from dental to medical to uh, people looking to print parts for cars. There's even one guy who's looking to print horseshoes, which might seem unusual if you look at it at first case, but if you're printing horseshoes for a multi-million dollar horse, maybe it's not such a bad idea. So the small format printer by itself is quite a unique technology and it's got a lot built into it. How it's not the truly disruptive technology that the large format printer is going to be. With the large format printer, we're looking to be able to print around about a ton a day. So approximately 100 times faster than existing machines. And at this point, we're looking to move into a point where printing is actually cost competitive with traditional manufacturing. So we listed on the ASX around about seven months ago. And since then, we've had a pretty decent run. We listed at 20 cents. We're currently sitting on around about $2.30 odd. Uh, the price has gone up as high as $5.39. So the investors who invested at the IPO would have received around about a 1,000% return so far. And if you've been one of the very early, early seed investors who got in right at the start of the business, if you'd invested $10,000 then, it'd be worth well over half a million dollars today. However, and this is important to note, we still believe that there's significant value to be built into the business. And here's some of the reasons why. Over the last two and a half years or so, and from a very early stage of the business, we were getting contacted by fairly large global organizations. And by fairly large, I'm talking about companies worth around about $300 billion. So as you can imagine, it's quite unusual for a small company from Perth to be contacted by such large organizations. Now, the reason they're all interested in this is because of the large format technology. So to give an example, Mining in Australia is a relatively important part of the economy. One of the mining companies we went to see uh, showed us one of their warehouses. It's got about $500 million of the parts in it. And they're very keen to replace all of those parts with printed parts. But they showed us an example of three parts which they had and they said, look, we're burning through an awful lot of these. Is there any chance that you could use large format technology when it becomes available to print these? They cost about $80,000 each and typically it takes them between six weeks and two years to get hold of one of these parts. And we did some back of the envelope calculations and showed them that potentially they could print them for five to $10,000, have a higher spec part and print it inside a day instead of it taking that length of time. So needless to say, they were pretty interested. So think about this one for a moment. Let's arbitrarily say the large format machine costs $5 million. We haven't actually fixed the price yet, but let's say it costs $5 million. Then the payback time for that company on the machine is going to be under a month, which is incredibly fast for capital payback. And another thing to bear in mind is that one of the mining companies we were speaking to has $4 billion worth of stock just sitting on the shelf. And they're interested in replacing a significant portion of that stock with printed parts. So, a, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, one of the other companies that visited us was an oil and gas company. Now, they came along and brought a device, which I was quite interested in, because I often talk about it. It was called a counter-current heat exchanger. Now, a counter-current heat exchanger is basically a device for getting heat out of one liquid and putting it into another one. It doesn't sound very difficult, but it's used a lot in industry. The reason it's particularly interesting for me is it's a very, very complicated piece of equipment. There are literally tens of thousands of small pipes in this part going across one each other in very, very close contact. They're very difficult to manufacture, yet they're relatively simple to print. 
So they brought along one of these parts and they actually had it printed by a research organisation in Australia. They sat it down, showed it to me and I asked them how long did that take to print? And they thought about it for a minute and said, oh, around about three weeks. And then they said, how long would it take to print using your large format technology? And I did some rough calculations in my head and said, oh, around about 13 minutes. So you can understand why they were extremely excited and interested at that point. The possibility for them to create replacement parts and have them available in a very short time frame is extremely interesting to them. So this is what makes such a compelling argument to these groups. Potentially, they can eliminate overheads by reducing inventory. And secondly, there's a possibility of them reducing the cost of parts by up to 90%. This is quite a significant driver for change, which is why we believe that potentially this technology could revolutionise the entire $4 trillion metal manufacturing market. And bearing in mind also that the oil and gas industry and the mining industry, while relatively large, are still a small part of that metal manufacturing market. And we may have the potential to completely disrupt that market entirely. So the question is, where are we at now? with the large format printer. So we built the prototype to prove out the technology, which is quite an important step. Where we are now is we're testing that technology to prove it out. Essentially, when you're testing this sort of technology and we're going through the parameter stage, it's a process of printing a dot first, then printing a line, and then printing a square, and then printing a cube. And when you can print a cube, you can print anything. So to understand it, firstly, as part of the step with the technology, we had it verified by an independent third party. And what that means is before we listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, the board was very clear with me. They said, David, we like you, you're a nice guy, you're, we believe what you're saying, but we actually need to get somebody else to check it just so we can make sure that you're not just making this up. So we had a guy from a local university who's had 25 years experience in 3D metal printing, about as long as the industry's been around. And um, he had a look at the technology and basically gave us a report saying, look, the large format printer not only will be able to print as 100 times faster than existing machines, but that will probably be the lower bound of what it's capable of. So the truly revolutionary thing about this technology is not that it can print high resolution parts like other machines, but that it's very, very fast. And what we're looking at here is to be cost competitive with traditional manufacturing. And we believe that when you hit a point where you're actually cost competitive with traditional manufacturing, then all of a sudden, virtually everything will end up getting printed. One of the key concepts here, which is quite common throughout 3D printing, is this idea that complexity is free. And what that means, with the advent of the large format printer technology, the cost of actually manufacturing the part comes down to four things. The cost of the raw materials, which is the powders, the cost of the inventorization of the machine, the electricity going into it, and any other minor consumables, and then the cost of the digital part if you have one. So the primary driver there, with the large format printer having a long lifespan and a relatively low amortized cost, is actually the cost of the consumables. What that does mean, if you have a part which weighs 10 kilos, let's say a solid block of stainless steel, and you print a solid block of stainless steel, and then you have another part which also weighs 10 kilos and it's got 10,000 tiny tubes built into it as part of a counter current heat exchanger, those two parts are gonna cost you exactly the same amount to print bearing in mind very minor differences for possibly design. This means that part, particularly high complex parts will be able to be printed very cheaply compared to their existing processes. So just as another example, a, a large aircraft company that we've been talking to, they have a division within their company that just does 3D printing. That's all they do all day long. They don't just print parts for their own company, but they also print parts for other companies as well. And one of the problems I've been running into is that nine times out of 10, because the printing process is slow, so slow, they can't make a business case for the parts because at two to $3,000 a kilo, that's an enormous cost. And most manufacturers can't bear that cost. With a large format printer, the equation reverses entirely. That basically printing a part makes com perfect commercial sense. So as I mentioned, we're currently trialling the prototype of the large format printer to test out the technology. And once we finish that trialling, I'll be able to stick up my hand and announce to the world, yes, this technology works and it's behaving how we believed it would. And I think that's going to be an interesting inflection point for the company because 
There are a lot of people watching this space, and what we're doing is quite revolutionary. Now, whilst the prototype is basically a scaled down version of the large format printer, bear in mind that the full size version is about the size of a small C container, and it has a build area which, while it couldn't quite print a car in one go, it could certainly print it in two. We're looking at two and a half meters long, one and a half meters wide, and one and a half meters high. So just about the size of this stage, to give you a, a visual. <clears throat> so, as we worked on the design of the large format printer, we realized something which is kind of obvious if you think about it, which for every large format printer, if it can print a ton worth of parts a day, then it's going to need a ton worth of metal powders a day to be supplied to it, which is the consumable. And obviously that's what we're going to be doing as one of the business arms of the company. So if you look at one large format printer using a ton a day, that's about 300 tons a year at an arbitrary cost and a fairly low cost of $10 a kilo for stainless steel powder, that'd be $3 million a year per machine that it would be using in consumables. Because of this, we're structuring the whole powder production process as an integral part of the business. So what we're looking at there, we've developed some new technology which will potentially allow us to produce much higher quality powders at a much lower cost, which is one of the reasons we're in discussions with all of the world's global man powder manufacturers, not just because we could be their largest customer, but because they're also interested in potentially licensing that technology from us. Another integral part of the business as we move forward is what we're calling pay for print licensing or something similar to an iTunes store where somebody can download a part and have it certified in real time. So how this would work is that a company who's an OEM or an original equipment manufacturer would work with us or with one of our partners like Whirly Parsons. They'd go through a certification process where the part is printed repeatedly uh, until they've hit a point where they're absolutely confident that every time it's printed, it's absolutely fit for service. Then the part and that printing process is uploaded to our store and a customer can download it and have it certified in real time while it's being printed. Now, that whole little circuit where you've got a mine site printing a part, a store which is downloading the parts, and the OEM who's creating the certifi certified part, we believe that's quite a useful ecosystem because the OEM's happy because he's been able to maintain market. Unlike what happened with Napster in 1999, the customers or the mine site's happy because they've been able to get a part in a short time frame, much lower cost. And we're happy, obviously, because we've sold printers to both of these companies, powers, and also have managed to get a cut of the digital part on the way through. So, We've had a number of critical milestones over the last 12 months, which have all been quite significant. And we've grown pretty rapidly and we're continuing to do so. We started with about a year and a half ago with three staff, and we're up to 20 um, with another 11 part-time. We've just recently signed a term sheet with Worley Parsons, if you don't know who they are. They're a $2.5 billion engineering services company with around about 26,000 employees. Now, you might ask why we did this. There's a number of reasons, but broadly speaking, they're a pathway to market. Um, there's a problem we see happening when companies are looking to convert parts to be printable, and we believe they'll be able to help us with that. We're also looking at setting up a print bureau with them and also potentially working on them with powders. <clears throat> We've done a recent raising in the last month or so where we raised $7 million to accelerate our pathway to market with the medium and large format printers. We see that since GE bought a couple of 3D printing companies that the market's changed, and so we decided to accelerate our program to move forward. You can note that I'm one of the primary shareholders of the company as the people who started it, and that over 50% of the stock is held by staff and 55% uh, in escrow. So a couple of things I'd like to say as I close. Firstly, by all means, this 20 minutes, even though it's longer than 10, there's a fairly short time to cover all this stuff. So we've got to stand upstairs and by all means come and have a talk to me. But I'd like you to think about this. In the next 12 months, we're projecting to have the large format printer in operation. Now, we're planning to build the first one 
but we're also planning to print the second one. So we're going to make the first one, but around about 95% of the parts in the large format printer have been designed so that they can be printed. And we believe that this will give us an ability to scale in a way that's been absolutely unparalleled in the entire history of manufacturing. And potentially within five years, we could disrupt a fairly significant portion of the $4 trillion middle manufacturing market. I'll leave you to do the maths on that one, but feel free to give me a, come and have a chat to me afterwards. Thanks for your time.